polices the internet. A mentally disabled teenager is attacked, his ordeal shown live on Facebook. Disturbing questions again raised about what's being posted on social media. Should it be censored and by whom? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. It's being described as despicable, sickening, a hate crime. Four Americans have been criminally charged for beating a mentally disabled man and showing it live on the internet. Police in Chicago say the black suspects tied up the 18-year-old white victim, cut his hair until his scalp bled, and forced him to drink from the toilet. The youths can be heard shouting profanities against white people and President-elect Donald Trump. The teen's ordeal was broadcast live on Facebook, then went viral before the video was finally removed. When a downstairs neighbor calls the police complaining that, uh, of all the noise upstairs, um, the police respond and the two female offenders now go downstairs. They're angry that the police were called. They kick in the door of that apartment, hence they are both charged with the burglary. Um, that gives our victim an opportunity to get out. Facebook says it has a team constantly on call to monitor live videos for inappropriate content and to respond to users. The company said we do not allow people to celebrate or glorify crimes on Facebook and have removed the original video for this reason. In many instances, though, when people share this type of content, they're doing so to condemn violence or raise awareness about it. In that case, the video would be allowed. Let's bring in our panel of guests from Copenhagen, Errol Balkan, founder and chief lead designer at Indy, a social justice and technology company. From Berlin, Julia Kruger, a writer at netspolitik.org, and Jennifer Pivas, senior lecturer at London College of Communication and the University of the Arts London. Thank you all, and I'm going to start with the same question to all of you. What responsibility, if any, does Facebook bear for the fact that their site was used to broadcast this horrific crime. Errol, I'm going to start with you. Um, well, Facebook bears full responsibility, of course. Uh, Facebook is a private space. Uh, it's like a shopping mall. And uh, if uh, there is a poster hanging on a shopping mall, then they are responsible for the contents of that poster. Um, so uh, they have full responsibility. Julia, your thoughts? I think it's very dangerous to claim responsibility from Facebook for content because Facebook is not a neutral content provider as other newsletters are. Okay, um, Jennifer? I think that I, I would agree with actually both responses. On, on the one hand, Facebook is responsible uh, for the content that is circulating, however, but more in, the, in so far as if there's issues with the content, then they need to have an open procedure where people can actually see what steps are being taken to remove or, or, in, or in terms of the decisions to, to keep content. That's not a tran as it stands right now, that's not very transparent. And I think this is where a lot of the responsibility for Facebook should be placed. Errol, you said that Facebook bears full responsibility for this. What does that look like to you? Well, um, it, it looks like, uh, you know, any other media company uh, is responsible for what it broadcasts, in a sense. So uh, Facebook, of course, um, on the uh, surface doesn't look like a media company immediately, but really we can look at it as a media company that has about two billion active, you know, non-paid contributors a day. Um, they are a private company. Uh, they're, 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 I mean, they're a publicly traded company, but they're, they're private property. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, of course, they are responsible for what they put out there. And if we don't like that, and if we think that that's bad for freedom of speech, and if that's bad for democracy, quite possibly, which I do believe, then we need to look into alternatives that are decentralized, uh, where one 
American company doesn't have all of this control over what we see and what we don't see. Because, I mean, what is our success criteria here? If we get censor to be, uh, sorry, Facebook to be better at censoring, um, do we win? Uh, they already censor. I mean, they do better than censorship. Facebook decides what each of us gets to see and what they don't get to see with their algorithms every day, two billion of us almost. Um, so, you know, what, what do we really want here? Do we want uh, an American corporation to be better at censorship? Or do we want to create a technology, uh, a, a, an infrastructure for technology for human communication that is owned and controlled by people where we do have human rights like freedom of speech? Okay, you, you touched on a lot there and we are going to dig into that. Um, Jennifer, let me ask you though, it's something that he started off with at the beginning is the premise that Facebook is a media organization. It, 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 because they seem to push back against that. Are they a media organization as you see it? Are they just a social media organization? Are they just a tech company? What are they at their core? And is that changing? I mean, I think if you ask what Facebook is at their core, they're an organization that are trying to monetize the engagement and therefore the data of its users, full stop. So if you think in terms of why would they create a feature like Facebook Live? You know, on the one hand, you know, are they a benevolent organization that wants to increase uh, the discussions and the citizenship rights of its users? No, of course not. They've created uh, Facebook Live precisely because it's going to increase the engagement of the users that are on that platform. When engagement increases, it, uh, if so for Facebook Live, what does that give them? It gives them geotags. This is a rich data location information. This is very useful for advertisers where they're making a lot of their money. Uh, and so whatever they can do to ensure that users use that website as much as possible, they're going to do that. In terms of a media organization, they like to present themselves that, that way. We know statistically 62% 60, of users are getting their information first from, from social media platforms like Facebook. And their algorithm privileges news articles that come in through the feed. And so as users, you're always going to see those. Uh, so they're, 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 they're a media organization in terms of they're a large distributor of, of information. They're not at this point fully creators of that information, but that also is changing as they move into to try to compete with Netflix and Amazon. So it's kind of difficult question to fully unpack, but I think first and foremost, they're, they're a business. Julia, do you see it that way as well, that, that, that the bottom line, they are a business trying to make money and they don't necessarily have the same responsibilities that a, a media or, or news or information outlet would have? I think that uh, Facebook fulfills very different roles in very different communities, whereas in Western societies it's mainly used as a news distribution channel. Uh, it is much more used as a social media outlet in the Arab world and in large parts of Africa it's just the internet itself. So I think any regulation needs to put this into consideration and I would ask to be very, very careful with asking for further law enforcement responsibilities by Facebook because we have very difficult experiences in Germany. In Germany, the government asked Facebook and Google and Twitter last year to take down content upon user requests within 24 hours. And it was extremely unsatisfying on the one hand with the amount of content taken down, um, which is of course due to the difficulties to assess whether content is illegal or not. On the other hand, it was extremely unsatisfied with the lack of transparency of content taken down, with the lack of transparency with the whole procedure uh, of content distribution, revision of content take, being, being taken down, or even having an adequate contact person. Uh, so I think it's extremely difficult to ask for further law enforcement against Facebook without asking for more transparency about the distribution of news in general and also the algorithms underlying the distribution of news in the feeds. So how do you reconcile that? Various countries around the world have different types of, of hate speech laws um, that is separate and apart from social media, but how do you reconcile that with the fact that people can and do go on social media and post whatever they want? What, is, what does freedom of speech look like 
on social media, Errol, whether it's Facebook or, or Twitter or wherever. What does freedom of speech actually mean in that context? Well, if you're talking about the system that we have today, then um, our freedom of speech is comprised of our freedom to go into shopping malls and have conversations there. Um, and the people who own the shopping malls, whether that's Facebook or Google or whoever else, uh, get to decide what we can say and what we can't say. Um, and they have full say on that because we are on their private property um, and they get to decide what freedom of speech uh, we have or we don't have. Um, so that's the system that we have today. Um, in other, I don't think in this other is words, you don't have a you don't have a constitutional right to post what you want on Facebook. In other words, no. I mean, our constitutional rights, if in those countries that we have them towards freedom of speech, protect us from uh, to protect our freedom of speech from the government, not exactly. from corporations, not from not on private property. So I think that's a very important distinction we need to make. Um, Jennifer, your thoughts on that as well. What, what rights do people have to post what they want in a social, social media setting? Not necessarily, obviously, criminal as we started off with at the beginning, but just something rude or offensive or hate speech. I mean, it's, I, I think it's a difficult question, question to ask. I mean, on the one hand, people need to have people should have the right to to uh, to express themselves but I think when you go into a public forum then there needs to be some at least ground rules for for respect of, of the other people who are there that's that's not to say uh, that uh, you should start deciding what people can and can't say but at the same time if you're if you're going to be in a public space then you have to be accountable for the things that you're saying and 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 discussing Julia, let's pick up on what you were talking about, about what's happening in Germany. And Germany is taking this issue very seriously because they have really strict um, hate crimes laws on the books. How far do you think that they're willing to go to hold sites like Facebook responsible for the content that is put on their sites? Um, in the moment, Germany is clearly pressing towards a greater liability of Facebook, according to other news outlets. The question for me personally, it's not how far you would go, but how to effectively limit hate speech and especially how to limit its spread from online violence to real world violence. Okay, let's talk about then, we're talking about holding Facebook and the social media platforms accountable. Um, how do you do that? Is it simply a matter of, of manpower, Errol, of having enough bodies that are actually going to monitor it? Um, well, that's what they would like to avoid because it increases their costs, of course. What they would ideally like to do is to improve their algorithms um, and so that they can maybe even preemptively, algorithmically uh, filter certain things out. But you have to realize they already do this. This is how Facebook works. Algorithms decide what you see, what you don't see. Uh, so that's going to be a natural course of what they do anyway. Um, I, I think, again, the, we're, we're probably talking about this issue on a very superficial level here. Um, I think the real question should be whether or not we're happy with having a handful of American corporations decide uh, on what people in the world see and what they don't see and what is permissible and what's not permissible, um, whether we're happy with a handful of these organizations, these corporations, um, being gatekeepers um, and filters of reality. Um, and if not, then we need to start not just talking but acting about creating alternatives that are decentralized, that are not corporate owned but possibly owned by the commons, by everyone, um, where every individual has a space on the internet where they can express their views and um, which they own and control. And in that case, policing becomes what it is, you know, normally it becomes traditional policing. Um, and we already have systems in place for that. The problem we have today is because we're living basically in a corporatocracy where a handful of corporations have all of this ownership and control. And then we're saying, how should they behave? Should they behave nicer or should they behave, you know, not so nice? I don't think either one of those is going to get us to where we need to be if we care about human rights and democracy going forward. Jennifer, uh, to Errol's point, um, yes, that has been happening for a while in a lot of countries, particularly in the U.S., that media corporations are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. There's fewer and fewer to choose from. There's the centralized power, if you will, that 
even companies now like Facebook and, and Twitter have. Um, do you share his concerns or what concerns do you have about that? I absolutely share his concerns and I think that when it comes to Facebook, so for example, you know, they'll tell you well, if, we, if there's a piece of content that's problematic or that people find offensive, you can let us know and then we will review it through our community standards uh, process and then perhaps we'll take it down, as was the case with, with the video that was shown two days ago. However. Uh, in t when people ask, well, why did it take 30 minutes for it to come down when there was another uh, video that was circulating a little while ago back that was also seen as problematic, and that came down quite a bit faster. And for this, they had no response. So at least I think a starting point has to be, why is this what Frank Pasquale would call a black box? You are making decisions about whether content is good or bad, is, is, is viewable or not, uh, and as a member of the public, we have absolutely no idea what process is in place, how they're reviewing it, what these standards actually entail, um, nothing. So I think, you know, from, from the user's perspective, and I mean, I think this also goes, you know, as, as was also said, in terms of the information that we receive. If, if we look closely at the Edgeware algorithm, which is the algorithm that uh, d determines what information is going to come into any user's newsfeed, what does that Edgeware algorithm do? It, it looks at that user, it looks at their political beliefs, it looks at where they shopped, it looked at where they went outside of Facebook, and based on all of this information that gets uh, brought together in a very quick second through this computer processing determines, well, this person has these beliefs, and therefore we're going to show them these friends of theirs because their beliefs are similar, okay. or we'll show them these news stories, right. etc. So, so Julia, there needs to be, and there needs to be an accountability for what, how are these decisions right. uh, about the information that Absol we see being done? Absolutely. So, Julia, as you've heard, Errol and Jennifer have both said that they think. Um, transparency um, would help. Do you agree with that as well? If there was more transparency in how these these media companies or wh whatever we're choosing to call them, if there are more transparency in how and why they do the things they do, would that make a difference? I clearly uh, agree with the call for transparency and I also clearly agree with the need for more decentralized services. But I think as long as Facebook has such a monopoly, we need to tackle this. And what I found extremely interesting was a project from Kenya called IHUB, from IHUB Research, and they had the problem of violence in the course of elections. And then they developed an open source based monitoring system uh, which allowed, on the one hand, the timely intervention in case of violence spreading from online to offline, and on the other hand, it it provided a lot of details about how hate speech dynamics work, who's hating, what, what is the audience, what are the key players, and whom, who needs to be tackled to really reduce hate speech online. And I think it's extremely interesting to have an external monitoring of social media platforms, a monitoring that would, in cooperation with police or security forces, enable the timely intervention into cases of violence, and which would, in cooperation with Kurds and law enforcement, allow a strategic litigation of haters online. Okay. Um, Errol, do, you know, democracy, they say, works best with um, an informed, active electorate, right? That's when you get th the best. Um, could the same be said for Facebook, that sometimes it's just going to come down to the users and, and holding up other users accountable? Um, I, I don't know. I think that sounds a little bit like victim blaming to me. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, it is essential, of course, that we have an informed public, but um, we should ask ourselves why we don't today. I mean, uh, Facebook has the same uh, business model. Jennifer uh, touched upon this earlier, uh, has the same business model as most of the publishing industry today. And it is not about informing people. It is about tracking people, analyzing their behavior, storing that indefinitely, and then exploiting 
exploiting it and monetizing it. Uh, so uh, just recently in Europe, for example, Axel Springer was in a court case where their lawyer, they're, they're a huge publisher, and their lawyer said uh, that uh, for them, uh, their core business model is advertising and that journalistic content is the means by which they get people to view the ads. So in other words, we, as in journalism today, in publishing today, uh, journalism is, is seen as bait for this business model that I call people farming. Uh, so I think that's the huge problem here that we have. Um, how can we have an informed public when all of these publishing companies and Facebook and Google, et cetera, their whole business is to farm people, their factory farms for human beings? Wow. Um, Jennifer, you know, there's been a, a, a few cases that have popped up over the years of law enforcement wanting Facebook or Twitter or one of those companies to hand over certain information about a particular user in, in a criminal case. Um, and, and it seems for the most part they have resisted, but how much privacy should um, someone expect when they use those sites? And should they go into it knowing they're going to know everything about you? I mean, I think this is this is a very big debate that you're that you're touching on, and I mean, certainly in in Europe, they're they're trying to ensure right now that people do have that right to privacy. The problem is with all of these different sites. Every time you press OK to the to the terms and conditions, and uh, you're you're effectively agreeing to allow them not not just government to see all of your information should the case like you've just mentioned occur, but but corporations as well. And I think I think for the user, the full implications and consequence. On the one hand, you can tell that to someone, and I have this discussion with my students all the time, and they'll and they'll all roll their eyes and say, "Yes, I understand this completely." <laughs> but then you show them you show them a, another moment where that's you. So, for example, I had them put a, a search term in Google's search and look at the suggested searches that came down from that word, and ask them to look next to each other. So to look uh, at their at their neighbors and everyone's mouth fell to the floor when they realized all of those searches were different and then having a discussion about well why were these different because all of this information from all of these places are being aggregated and used in these different algorithms so on the one hand we understand this on the other hand we don't fully understand the implication of 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 what it means really to have no more privacy anymore Julia is there any incentive for companies, these companies to, to be held to account or to do anything any differently going forward? Um, I think the question of how we can have a constructive society discourse again is a very interesting one. And there have been real innovations in America during the last months. On the one hand, based on research on comment moderation and also privacy also privacy issues um, by the CORAL project, also by INSEE, you can, you can moderate discourses very well based on technology, based on open technology and based upon good privacy rules. There's one new platform called INSEE, which combine a positive vision of the community with very strict rules of discourse, which can be changed by the leaders in the groups themselves. And they also combine very good comments moderation and also very good privacy, privacy issues to allow or to, 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 to establish a con constructive discourse again, I think, which we really need because there are much worse problems than hate speech online. There's a climate change, there's uh, the immigration, there's social cleavage. So I think it's a real challenge how society can get back to a co constructive discourse and how we can do this in the digital world with help of technology. Wouldn't that be the wonderful goal to get back to constructive discourse? Let's all hope that that happens and let's keep having discussions like this. I appreciate it very much. Thank you to all of my guests. Arl Balkin, Balkin that is, Julia Kruger and Jennifer Pibus. Thank, thank you. you all very much. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime if you go to our website, aljazeera.com, for further discussion. Yes, 
Go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story for me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team. Bye for now.